February 8th. It's kind of a, a memory center uh, Grand Rounds today. We've got Michelle and Kim who are gonna talk to us. And uh, just to give you a little background on the slides, on Friday at Memory Clinic, one of our uh, things that keeps us happy is to, to share cartoons mostly related to dogs. And I'm gonna give you a little sampling of those today. So this is today's CME code, SEBFED. SEBFED, and Will will put it in the chat. So as most of you probably know, Valentine's Day is next week on Tuesday. This year, Brock's, uh, which is the company that makes these things called Sweethearts, uh, the theme is uh, pets and puppy love because of the large number of people who adopted pets during COVID. So just a little FYI. The International Stroke Conference is in Dallas this week. Our department is very, very well represented with lots of people. They did a little mini presentation at the research and conference, research and progress conference. That was great. Uh, thanks to Brian for arranging that and good luck to all of them. So this is one of our first cartoons. I think I was the one who came with this one, but uh, you know, okay. Uh oh. All right, uh, who's got the phone on? Thank you. Um, doximity voting is open on US News. Um, I know it's something that some people aren't particularly great with, but as I always say, your mother wants you to be at a higher rank place and it helps us continue to get great residents by being high ranked, so please, uh, get on Doximity and vote for our department. This is number two. This is a Michelle cartoon. Nobody owns a dog here. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, Duke is becoming Hopkins, it seems. So we're about to start trying out some uh, metal detectors at the entrance to, I believe, the immersion room and to some other places. I always, my first visit here, I still remember just walking in the door and there was a sweet little old lady there who wanted to know how to help me get where I was going. And now we're gonna have metal detectors. So that's progress of the sort. This one is mine. <laughs> okay, save the date, February 13th is International Epilepsy Day and on February 21st, our epilepsy group is having a winter research symposium, five to six. Uh, anyone interested, just contact Will or go on the Epilepsy Center website. This one is mine, it could have been Kim's. <laughs> Oh, come on, that's good. <laughs> All right, save the date, February 23rd. Anyone who needs a new headshot, uh, contact, email Will. And uh, there is a dream <laughs> seminar, Mitch Friedman, who's kind of the father of multiple sclerosis in the Triangle in North Carolina, worked at Raleigh Neurology for many, many years, is going to give a talk. And he, he always gives a wonderful talk. This is one of Kim's. <laughs> That's the psychiatrist and the snake there. <laughs> All right, research roundup. Simon Gregory was a senior author of a study that examined genetic and epigenetic uh, factors and their relationship to variable oxytocin levels in autism. Our own Kim Johnson is gonna talk to us in a minute and Andy Liu. We're part of the team that looked at retinal microvascular changes in Alzheimer's disease. And again, this is our CME code. And we are honored to our case presentation today is Michelle Sanfilippo, who's our physician assistant in the memory clinic, is a wonderful human and a truly dedicated clinician. Oh, that's the next one. So I gotta come out of this. It's amazing how you get to a certain age rather than do it. You have to tell yourself you're doing it so that you know it works. <laughs> Come out of this, get that me. X. All right, let's get the X down. And then Michelle, is this interesting case one? Uh, no. Oh, case presentation, there you go. There you go, there you go. In the end, we get it done. And 
off you go. Excellent, thank you. Good morning. I'll talk into the mic so that you. Good morning. I bring a case presentation to you from the Memory Disorder Clinic. Um, I had a 62 year old female uh, that was actually uh, presented initially to general neurology for worsening headaches and cognitive changes. Uh, the initial cognitive complaints were, was that she was getting disoriented while driving. Um, she does have a complicated history that included DVT and history of uh, lap band procedure. Um, so she had a pretty good workup with general neurology. They worked her up for temporal artery. Uh, by, she had an, a biopsy, MRI, MRA, which was all uh, thought, thought to be normal for age. Um, she was referred to the memory disorders after she was seen in the ED for a syncopal episode. Her BP meds were adjusted and she was weaned from the tricyclic antidepressant, which I believe was amitriptyline and topiramate. Um, I did order the EEG on the initial um, visit and that was, con that was normal. Uh, and her formal neuropsychological testing um, also revealed an executive function deficit, more so than memory, um, when they were talking about sequencing and, and attention. Um, so the recommendations were to work with her poor sleep. She had years of insomnia, uh, pain. Uh, she had an actual diagnosis of fibromyalgia and chronic depression. But this woman had a chronic mood disorder for most of her life and had on, been on many multiple medications. Um, several months after she had seen general neurology, she presented to the memory clinic um, and her MOCA was 14 over 30, but she was independent with her activities of daily living. Um, and it appeared that her cognitive status was worse than her functional status. Um, her performance was affected by her anxiety. She had a normal neuro exam, did have a family history of dementia, <clears throat> former smoker, but no alcohol. She said she was on too many medications for drinking. Um, I did send her to occupational therapy for cognitive training and retraining. And as a result, it was a patient was informed that she should not be driving, uh, which was also a devastating blow to her. Um, she continued to progress, declines in MOCA scores. Her husband actually came to her, uh, came with her for the next visit at my request um, as in order to give a uh, diagnosis of dementia, we have to show by somebody else that uh, she's having difficulties. Um, and that's when we talked about her progression from mild cognitive impairment to dementia. Uh, I did start her on Dinepazel. Um, She was really reluctant to do a, a lumbar puncture because of uh, long standing back pain, uh, which actually ended her career as a beautician. Um, but I did finally uh, was able to talk her into it uh, after again, and a repeat MRI was read as normal and no change compared to 2020. Um, although my view were slightly different, but uh, the PET scan was also read as normal. Um, and I also gave her guatiapine. I did work with her psychiatry team uh, to minimize her polypharmacy of medications and we stuck with guatiapine at bedtime. Uh, both her husband and patient reported good response and we completed the, the lumbar puncture. And this is what we found. Um, she had a normal A beta 42. Um, her tau was pretty elevated, uh, but the ratio of the P tau, phospholated tau, and the A beta 42 was high on the ratio, which, um, you know, now we have biomarkers at one time, you know, we had a clinical diagnosis, but, but fortunately in, in recent days, we have pathology that we can mix uh, uh, biology as well as clinical, um, but in my world, I still believe it's just as much of an art as a science. Um, but even with normal a, uh, a beta, what we discovered was is that the amyloid uh, assays are a little bit more unpredictable than the tau, and that tau is more sensitive and more reliable than the amyloid assays as markers of Alzheimer's pathology. Um, just again, uh, some uh, differentials. Uh, I did not think she had frontal temporal lobar degeneration and or CG, she, CJD, those were both ruled out. But my other thoughts uh, to this case presentation is uh, in, the, in the presence of, of normal amyloid, you know, what roles are alpha synuclein playing? Um, and I think we're gonna see more of those kinds of things uh, going forward. But the good news is this patient responded to treatment for Alzheimer's and that's her current working diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. So lots of tests and nothing to do in memory clinic. All right.
Thank you. <laughs> Kim, which one is yours? Grand Rounds up here, it's hidden. Okay. Get this Green out. Rounds, this one. No, that's me. This is you. Yeah. No, that's me. Is that you? That's me. Okay. All right. That's you. All right. Have a seat. You don't need to stand. <laughs> All right. So we're, we're really honored to have Dr. Kim Johnson. Uh, I'm not showing slides right now, so don't don't worry. Uh, Kim is the chief of our memory disorders division. She's an assistant professor of neurology as well as psychiatry and behavioral science, but she's 100% in our department now and we're just thrilled to have it. She's my boss. Uh, Kim went to the University of Pittsburgh where she was initially going to be a dermatologist, uh, but had an epiphany after 10 years and decided that psychiatry and then even geriatric psychiatry and then memory disorders was really her passion. And we're very fortunate for the train of events that led to that. Uh, as mentioned, she did a fellowship at Yale after her psych residency at, uh, at Duke. In addition to her role as the director of the memory division, she is also the associate director of the ADRC clinical core, i.e. she's the one who does all the work. Uh, and again, very grateful to that. Kim's just a wonderful person, a wonderful doctor. I've already got an appointment for her scheduled two years in advance from now, because that's I'm sure I'll need it. And uh, her talk today is neuropsychiatric comorbidities and medication present per, uh, prescribing to people with dementia in North and South Carolina. So thank you, Kim. This one. Okay. Did everybody see my screen? Yeah, okay. The really screen share. Thanks. Yep. It's all good. It's all good. Well, you are good. Okay. It's way down. Okay. Thank you so much, Rich. I really appreciate that introduction and a very generous introduction. Really appreciate. Michelle's case presentation today. And I think we're really happy to have a memory division grand rounds today. And just, you know, I'm talking, but I lead the department and just want everybody to know, I mean, lead the division, sorry. Just want everybody to know how much fun we have in memory disorders and um, how much um, we mean to each other as colleagues and also um, other people that are involved with us, our nursing staff, patients, caregivers, and also our Duke UNC ADRC research colleagues are really important to our mission. And I think we're a great group. I'm using the arrows. Okay, there we go. So today I am gonna be talking about neuropsychiatric symptoms. When we think about cognitive decline and dementia, um, we think more about cognitive disorders and the de decrease in memory, decrease in functioning, but patients with mild cognitive impairment and dementia do have a fair amount of neuropsychiatric symptoms associated with their disease. These are all the neuropsychiatric symptoms that have been described, including anxiety, depression, apathy, disinhibition, psychosis, agitation, sleep changes and appetite and eating problems. And I think a lot of neurology has some overlap with psychiatry and neuropsychiatric symptoms. You can think of, you know, like seizure disorder, uh, sleep, um, movement disorders, MS, yeah, and TBI. Um, so lots of neuropsychiatric symptoms that are relevant to neurology. So when, the prevalence of neuropsychiatric symptoms in patients with dementia is, is very high. A Cache County study in Cache County, Utah, which followed people uh, as memory and aging study over 15 years, found a five-year prevalence of at least one neuropsychiatric symptom in patients with dementia at 97%. 
The most common symptoms were anxiety, depression, and apathy. And I think that's also what we observe in the clinic. Many studies show that all patients with dementia will have at least one symptom. And then symptoms also co-occur with other symptoms and sort of synergize and imp increase the impact. So uh, depression, anxiety often occurs together, psychosis and agitation and sleep and wandering. So why are neuropsychiatric symptoms important? The reason they're important is because they have a huge impact on patients' lives, on caregivers' lives. So there's significant distress and poor quality of life for patients and caregivers in multiple studies. There are low, lower survival rates over a three-year period, especially when psychosis is present. There's earlier institutionalization and nursing home placement. And overall, these symptoms increase the cost of dementia care. So I would say also that neuropsychiatric symptoms can also worsen cognition. So in, in the clinic, I often use the example of anxiety with patients because we have so many patients with anxiety and the fact that cognitive decline worsens anxiety, but then anxiety worsens cognitive decline. So it's like the mouse on the wheel where everything's getting worse. And so we do know that patients with anxiety often have sleep disorders, decreased executive function, and more trouble functioning. So when we think about neuropsychiatric symptoms, we all, you know, as physicians or um, providers, we always want to think about how we can treat things. And the consensus summary through multiple studies is that these symptoms are very difficult to treat. There's no FDA approved medication specifically for the treatment of neuropsychiatric symptoms in dementia. There is some mild evidence for cholinesterase inhibitors. So this is generally uh, the first line of treatment that we do in the clinic is make sure that somebody is, is with dementia is on a cholinesterase inhibitor. Um, but these drugs do have a modest impact on neuropsychiatric symptoms and outcomes. Mostly, um, this was a meta-analysis that showed that anxiety, depression, and apathy are um, improved in mild, moderate Alzheimer's disease, but you can see that the improvement in cognition, the improvement on scales of functioning is very modest. Cholinesterase inhibitors might have more of an effect on Lewy body dementia and may actually improve psychosis, um, anxiety, depression, and apathy, um, but the doses need to be you know, at the maximum. Denepazil, 10 milligrams daily, and uh, rivastigmine six to 12 milligrams had some effect, but also again, very modest. So some of you might remember Jay Lusk's uh, grand rounds on the Sunrise Project back in July of 2022. And um, I was also involved in that project. It was a project where we looked at Medicare beneficiaries in North and South Carolina from 2014 to 2017 and wanted to know how often uh, neurodegenerative disease was diagnosed, um, Parkinson's disease and cognitive disorders. And then we also wanted to know about healthcare utilization. So one of the findings that was interesting from that study was that um, of people diagnosed with dementia in North and South Carolina, only 34% were on any dementia drug. So we can see that at the bottom here. And then uh, a further uh, objective of the study was to try and pick, uh, discover disparities by race or sex and uh, found out that 35% of white patients were on cholinesterase inhibitors, but only 27% of black patients were on cholinesterase inhibitors. So, and this correlates with other studies around the country. So this led uh, our group to come up with some expanded research questions specifically about anxiety, depression, and psychosis. So if cholinesterase inhibitors can have an effect on neuropsychiatric symptoms, um, we wanted to know specifically in North and South Carolina, what was the prevalence of anxiety, depression, and psychosis in patients with dementia? Were there differences by sex or race? And then what is the rate of anxiety medications, specifically benzodiazepines 
antidepressants and antipsychotic medication use in patients with dementia who have anxiety, depression, or psychosis, and were there any differences by race or sex, sort of similar to the differences that we found with the cholinesterase inhibitors. So as I mentioned, this was a cohort of Medicare North and South Carolina beneficiaries who are aged 50 and above uh, for the year 2017 only um, with the diagnosis of dementia for anxiety, depression, and psychosis. We identified dementia based on ICD-10 diagnosis of dementia in any position on an inpatient, outpatient uh, carrier, skilled nursing facility, or home health claim, or a prescription claim for a drug to treat dementia between January of 2017 and December of 2017. Then we identified anxiety and depression and psychosis in this cohort using validated coding algorithms generated by searching inpatient, outpatient, and physician claims. So um, to examine race, we created three categories uh, for analysis. The first one was non-Hispanic white, the second one was non-Hispanic black, and the third was race other than white or black or Hispanic ethnicity, and we termed this other race. Then we looked at the uh, psychotropic medication fill rate during 2017, searching Medicare Part D claims within the classes of anti-anxiety medications, antidepressants, and antipsychotic medications. So you can see our anti-anxiety uh, medication um, search here was limited to benzodiazepines, wanted to know uh, the rate of short, medium, and long-acting benzodiazepines in this population. Uh, for antidepressants, we looked at amitriptyline, bupropion, um, SSRIs, SNRIs, uh, mirtazapine, and then also the new serotonin agents, philazidone and vortioxidine. For antipsychotic medications, we looked at um, Haldol, which is uh, most commonly used first-generation medication, and then the second generation, the antipsychotics. And these were some of the uh, baseline characteristics that we found. And um, we can see that uh, in 2017, there was a prevalent dementia of 124,033 uh, patients in North and South Carolina with dementia. 46% had no psychiatric condition coded. 34% about, or almost 35% uh, had the presence of anxiety, 37% depression, and 14% psychosis. Most people, when they were coded for dementia, this was interesting, Alzheimer's disease was not coded as the diagnosis, it was mostly just dementia in general. And then if we look uh, through the states of North and South Carolina, uh, these, these numbers are about proportionate to the population where we see um, more patients in North Carolina with dementia uh, than South Carolina. And then um, it's interesting that uh, psychiatric conditions were, you know, of the people in North and South Carolina, um, neuropsychiatric symptoms were diagnosed more frequently in patients in North Carolina. So just to point out um, coexisting conditions and to show that the diagnosis of anxiety, depression, and psychosis were not mutually exclusive, um, people with anxiety here um, also could have the presence of depression and psychosis. So there is some overlap. Um, people with depression, um, could also have anxiety and psychosis, and then people with psychosis also had the presence of anxiety and depression. So there is a pretty large overlap in these, um, the diagnosis or coding of these neuropsychiatric symptoms. Then we looked at the rate of anxiety, depression, and psychosis, and we can see here these three uh, columns, and then um, also the rate of prescribing of medications, anti-anxiety, antidepressant, and antipsychotics in each category. Uh, we looked at this by race and uh, found uh, many significant factors, which I'll go over in future slides. Just wanted to show you a, an overview table. And then also looked at these same factors by sex. 
So um, I tried to, I, I think, you know, with Medicare data, charts like this get a little black and white <laughs> because they are black and white. So it's, it's hard to sort of pick out and go through things. So I tried to make some graphs for us today um, just to summarize some of these findings. So this, this was an interesting finding, the prevalence of a neuropsychiatric condition in patients diagnosed with dementia by age group. And that was summarized on the baseline characteristics. And what we found um, in, at least from this data, this Medicare data from North and South Carolina, is that no condition was more prevalent in the higher age groups. So when we get to 90 plus, more of those patients um, who are diagnosed with dementia actually had no psychiatric condition diagnosed. And then in this younger age group, 50 to 59, there was a higher prevalence of depression, anxiety, and psychosis in that group. And then as people age, the prevalence of the neuropsychiatric condition decreases, and then the prevalence of no condition increases. So we're not sure why. Um, that could be, um, you know, I, we're not sure why that uh, we found that finding. So then when we think about diagnosis by race of anxiety, depression, and psychosis, um, found that uh, we have anxiety, depression, and psychosis here. White race is in blue, um, black participants uh, in orange, and then other race in gray that white patients had higher rates, we can see of anxiety, depression, but black patients had higher rates of psychosis. Then when we look at medications by race, um, here's uh, graphs of anxiety, then depression and psychosis with each of the medications graphed out by race, again, white uh, race uh, for white participants or patients in blue, um, black patients in orange and other race in gray shows that black patients and patients of other race ethnicity filled antipsychotic prescriptions at higher rates compared with white patients in all subgroups, including anxiety, depression, and psychosis. And then white patients filled anti-anxiety and antidepressant medications for anxiety, depression, and psychosis at higher rates than black patients or patients of other race. Looking at uh, these same factors by sex um, and the uh, prevalence again here of on the bottom uh, dementia uh, overall, anxiety, depression, and psychosis found that females comprise the majority of dementia patients overall. And then female patients also have the higher prevalence of anxiety, depression, and psychosis. So this would be males in blue and then females in orange. And when we looked at medications by sex, again, anxiety, depression, and psychosis, each graphed here with the anti-anxiety, antidepressant, and antipsychotic medication, um, females in orange, males in blue, found that females, uh, female patients filled anti-anxiety and antidepressant medications at higher rates than male patients across all diagnosis. And then in patients with anxiety or psychosis, male patients were more likely to fill antipsychotics than female patients. Um, this was uh, not significant for the psychosis category right here. So when we think overall about medication use in the dementia population for anxiety, depression, and psychosis, um, I think we can summarize that in, in dementia patients with these diagnoses, um, uh, antidepressants which are um, featured here in orange, were prescribed at a higher rate than anti-anxiety or antipsychotic medications overall. So also um, we can summarize and say that almost half of patients uh, are in all uh, diagnosis are taking an anti-anxiety medication, which would be a benzodiazepine. Uh, greater than th two thirds take an antidepressant medication and greater than one quarter take an antipsychotic medication. So when we think about the results, um, just trying to 
see what to make of the results that we found in, in North and South Carolina. Um, the, the fact that black patients are diagnosed with psychosis more uh, than white patients has been reported in past Medicare studies and studies of racial differences. So and when, when those studies try and ask why this occurs, um, there are some theories about caregiving practices and that maybe caregiving practices differ among white and black families. So one study found that there were higher rates of caregiving in the home among black and Hispanic families, which might lead to higher recognition of psychosis by black and Hispanic caregivers compared to white caregivers. And another study found that uh, black patients might seek care for dementia at more advanced stages uh, when hallucinations and delusions were more likely to appear. So this may account for the higher uh, rate of diagnosis of psychosis. So um, when thinking about why this is occurring, it could, um, one, one study uh, found in, uh, published in 2022 that it could possibly be due to a higher mistrust of the medical system by black patients due to systemic racism and the cost of care, and then also lack of access to specialty care. When we think about lack of access to specialty care, before and after a dementia diagnosis, um, when, when patients aren't able to seek specialty care in their area, they're, they're more often treated in primary care settings. And there's a possibility that dementia might also be diagnosed more often in primary care settings, just because of the limited time there is to, um, to, for the evaluation. And I think when you're talking about trying to evaluate psychosis, there's a lot of nuances to the diagnosis and delusions can be easily confused with confabulation, which is part of dementia progression and um, just wondering about the accuracy of the diagnosis itself. Um, what about the finding that black and other race patients filled more antipsychotic medications for anxiety, depression, and psychosis uh, compared to white patients? And this, this finding has also been confirmed by other studies. So um, I would say that the higher rate of psychosis in black patients in this cohort could explain the higher rate of antipsychotic use, but it doesn't fully account for the higher antipsychotic prescriptions filled among black patients with anxiety or depression. So there is some uh, questioning whether the lower use of cholinesterase inhibitors that may have some effect, uh, moderate or mild to moderate effect on uh, psychosis could um, possibly explain some of this finding. Then I think it's pretty common uh, that females have higher rates of neuropsychiatric symptoms, not only uh, in our study, but also in, in other studies. So uh, this is very consistent with past studies and not sure why, but it is hypothesized to be partially attributable to the APOE4 allele differences before, uh, between the sexes. So, and that's something that needs further evaluation um, in other studies. So then uh, females filling benzodiazepines is uh, uh, very commonly known um, in the United States, uh, also around the world in Canada and Europe. And this was a study uh, of benzodiazepine uh, fill rate in uh, the United States, I'm sorry, benz benzodiazepine use, and found that females uh, pictured here in blue have higher rates than males in black across all age groups from 18 to 80. And then uh, there's widening of the gap as people age. So it's interesting to note too, how many older Americans are uh, using benzodiazepines. So I wanted to think about the prevalence of neuropsychiatric symptoms that we found in our study compared to other studies. And if you'll remember, we found that um, anxiety was present in 35%, depression in 37%, and psychosis in 14%. And uh, some systemic reviews that I found showed that uh, of 20 studies of depression and anxiety, Depression had a prevalence of 39%, anxiety 39%. And then in 48, another review of 48 studies found depression with a prevalence of 42%, anxiety with a prevalence of 39%. 
and uh, this broke down, uh, there wasn't a category for psychosis, but they broke down uh, between symptoms of delusions at 31% and hallucination at 16%. So overall, there um, are very, I mean, all these studies are interesting in that they're part of other studies where they're diagnosing depression and anxiety by very formal metrics usually in the setting of clinical trials or other studies where they're looking at a sub-study of patients and trying to figure out how many patients have these symptoms. So there are very few studies um, estimating psychosis in large populations. Just in 2022, a recent sample of 20% of Medicare beneficiaries found a rate of 19.3%, and this was around the uh, Medicare, Medicare beneficiaries around the whole country. And then also found a high level of antipsychotic use and Depakote use in that patient population at 76.8%. So you can see in North Carolina, um, we're coming in a little bit lower on all of these numbers in North, sorry, North and South Carolina. So there is a large, uh, the authors of the, uh, the reviews noted that there is a large amount of heterogeneity across estimates, I mean, of estimates across studies. Um, and like I mentioned, many of the studies were prospective research studies, and not many studies have been done based on Medicare data or clinical practices, except for that most recent study on psychosis. So there is a um, just a question of are uh, the symptoms undercoded by physicians in the clinical setting, and then are symptoms diagnosed accurately in the clinical setting and by who, whose account, the patient or the caregiver? So I'm not sure we can take the, uh, the reviews of numbers of prevalence and then translate those to our study just because of these factors. So um, also when we look at medication fill levels, uh, we pointed out that a, um, a large proportion of patients with anxiety, depression, and psychosis are taking benzodiazepines uh, or at least filling prescriptions for benzodiazepines for antidepression medication and antipsychotics. And there's always the question in patients with dementia, are these medications effective and are they necessary? So at least for depression treatment, um, we have to ask, does depression and dementia respond to a medication? And the evidence for the effectiveness of antidepressants in patients with dementia is very weak. So overall, there were um, two Cochrane studies, one in 2002, it was updated in 2018, and showed that antidepressants really don't work very well in, in our patient population. This uh, quote is from a specific uh, study on sertraline or mirtazapine or sertraline and mirtazapine for uh, depression symptoms and showed that there was no benefit and the use of these treatments should be reconsidered. However, we do continue to treat depression with SSRIs um, in the clinic, but just wondering if it's better to develop other means of depression, other means of uh, treating depression, maybe realistic expectations. Uh, we have a lot of caregivers who say that their loved ones have depression. Um, and sometimes I wonder if this can be better differentiated from apathy. Like, are we, are we really diagnosing depression or are we diagnosing apathy? When a caregivers notice changes to their loved one, uh, they often say, you know, they're depressed. But if you ask the patient, are you depressed? They often say, no, you know, I'm not depressed. So I think it's, or at least my experience in the clinic, which is subjective and um, is that most of depression is apathy, where there's just loss of interest in activities, loss of interest in things the person used to do, and caregivers might misinterpret this as depression just because of the change in their loved one. So I think uh, what is really alarming um, to me and, and many others who are involved in geriatrics is is um, the anxiety treatment with benzodiazepines. And there's always this question of could benzodiazepines make dementia symptoms worse? 
And I, I will say that patients with dementia are at risk of major cognitive decline, even in addition to their level of cognitive decline with delirium when they're taking dementia, I mean, taking benzodiazepines. They're also at risk at fall, of falls due to sedation, decreased balance, decreased visual ability when taking a benzodiazepine. And studies have showed, uh, most recent study in 2020 showed that taking a benzodiazepine could improve cognition at any level of cognitive decline, or sorry, tapering a benzodiazepine. So um, in the clinic, when we see patients with benzodiazepines, I think one of our goals is to try and taper, get them off the medication list, or recommend that when they go back to primary care, that's uh, supervised and tapered. There is a high use in uh, reported in the study that I showed you um, um, back in the previous slide, and then also in other studies of uh, a high use in older adults in general. And this is uh, attributed to high rates of primary care prescribing of benzodiazepines. Uh, one study showed that nine out of 10 older adults with benzodiazepine use have prescriptions written in primary care. So um, there, again, there's less time spent with patients, um, maybe some deficits in knowledge about harms in the geriatric population as people age and uh, have decreased me drug metabolism. This high use in females um, has always been an interesting issue. And when we look at the higher rate of psychotic symptoms in females, um, just wonder if benzodiazepines could also be a contributor to some of those symptoms when females present with psychosis. And this uh, definitely needs more investigation. So, and then uh, psychosis treatment. We also wonder too, does psychosis in dementia require a medication? So there is, uh, you know, we've shown that uh, these symptoms are difficult to treat with medications. Um, also, a thorough evaluation needs to be done with the patient and caregiver because the symptoms might be harmless. So it's just part of their perception, the changes in the brain, and how they're seeing the world with uh, their progression of neurodegenerative disease. So it might not, many times these symptoms aren't distressing to the patient, and those are important questions to ask when we're evaluating patients and caregivers in the clinic. So um, one strategy might be uh, to manage caregivers' expectations and help them be able to accept the presence of the psychosis and not challenge the person's perceptions. Um, of course, this is um, always evaluated in the case of distress to the patient or the caregiver, which we do also see with psychosis, and then safety issues because we see a lot of psychosis uh, co-occurring with agitation symptoms. So um, the consensus for antipsychotics is these medications may be ineffective. A new uh, review in 2022 of 20 trials for second generation antipsychotics, aripiprazole, olanzapine, quetiapine, risperidone, found 10 positive studies and 10 negative. So it's sort of equivocal. And then another uh, 42 site trial, uh, the KD trial of antipsychotic treatment of olanzapine, quetiapine, and risperidone found that the adverse effects offset the advantages. So uh, we do try and first treat psychosis with non-pharmacologic treatments, mostly letting the caregiver know that um, therapeutic fibbing or lying to the patient is okay in this type of setting. Um, there's other therapies that are out there, validation or reminiscence therapy. Um, and it, but studies show that these uh, therapies don't decrease the symptoms, but they may increase quality of life. Also in nursing homes, it's found that when individuals have higher individual privacy or personalization in their room, they can have lower um, um, rates of psychosis. So, um, but I think overall in practice, drugs are preferred over the non-pharmacologic strategies. And this was confirmed in a research study, just showing that there is a lot of lack of provider training in the use of non-pharmacologic strategies. Uh, these strategies take a lot of time and training to um, introduced to caregivers, introduced to patients. There's a lack of reimbursement for these approaches. There's a lack of clear guidelines on these strategies, and there's a perceived lack of efficacy compared with antipsychotic medications. 
So this leads me to a topic of potentially inappropriate prescribing, which is very prominent in the geriatric literature. Uh, recently, um, as people get older, medication lists get longer and adverse effects get more frequent. So um, when we think about using all these drugs in dementia patients, uh, there have been some studies on the rates of potentially inappropriate prescribing and we just want to make sure that we're cautious of this when we're prescribing to patients also. So the definition of potentially inappropriate prescribing is the use of prescriptions in older adults that introduce a significant risk of adverse reactions or insufficient evidence of benefits when safer or equally or more effective therapeutic alternatives are available. So uh, one study found that patients with dementia are more vulnerable to potentially inappropriate prescribing. Um, the rates in dementia were 27.3% versus no dementia at 11.8%. And uh, when this occurs, it's associated with higher risk of hospitalization. The most offending drugs in this category were long-acting benzodiazepines, anticholinergic drugs, or the use of three or more psychotropic drugs. So there also could be patterns of inequality in medication prescribing to patients with dementia. This study in 2015 uh, in patients in British Columbia found that the higher incomes had lower odds of receiving an antidepressant, antipsychotic, or benzodiazepine, and higher odds of receiving a cholinesterase inhibitor than lower income areas. Also, uh, the study confirmed that females were prescribed benzodiazepines and antipsychotics at higher rates than males. So, and they looked specifically at uh, benzodiazepines, antidepressants, and antipsychotic prescribing in all patients with dementia. So not just patients who had a uh, neuropsychiatric diagnosis. So we can see in their study, there are, you know, these are large amounts of people with just a dementia diagnosis and no other neuropsychiatric diagnosis receiving these medications. So as far as conclusions go um, from our study and then from a review of the literature, um, I think more prospective studies on the prevalence and medication prescribing rates in the clinical setting uh, would be interesting. So it'd be interesting to look at a memory care uh, clinic versus a primary care clinic to see if there were any differences or disparities in medication prescribing or also diagnosing of these neuropsychiatric symptoms. And then also um, following up on Michelle's presentation and the fact that our clinic is doing a lot more biomarkers um, moving forward, and I think the whole um, field will be doing more biomarkers, um, neuropathological factors with biomarker or genetic effects, looking at the APOE4 allele or other biomarkers or inflammatory factors could add greater mechanistic depth to these analysis. And then also um, we're thinking about uh, quality improvement programs uh, here at Duke within each division in neurology. Um, so these type of programs on medication, you know, examining medication prescribing rates uh, with appropriate incentives to reduce inappropriate prescribing of psychotropic medications could help catalyze changes in practice patterns to improve outcomes for patients. And then possibly, you know, we might think about developing innovative community outreach programs, care delivery models to, in to increase early evaluation on the part of people with dementia and set expectations uh, for caregivers, expectations for patients about what to expect. And then as dementia specialists, we could expand professional education programs in general medicine settings. I think it's it's really hard to think, you know, we're, we're a small number of dementia specialists in neurology, geriatric medicine, and geriatric psychiatry. And so it's not, ex it, it's very unrealistic to think that we can see all patients, but we can do a lot to uh, educate general medicine um, settings about the appropriateness and efficacy of medications. So I just wanted to end on a few slides on what specifically this means for the memory clinic at Duke and how we can use this data and examine our practices. And I think that we should be describing our disparities in diagnosing and prescribing. 
um, cholinesterase inhibitors and uh, any medication that we give for neuropsychiatric symptoms. It's important to understand the root causes of the disparities and then build interventions to tackle disparities. So um, I think our goal is always to create better care delivery models that translate to change at the systems level here at Duke. So, um, you know, at Rich's request, when we, uh, when Rich requested that each division track their metrics uh, for quality improvement purposes and doing a search of EPIC, um, we decided in the memory division to track a cholinesterase prescribing rate just to see, you know, if our practices correspond with, with what's reported in the literature. And we did find that uh, when patients had a dementia diagnosis, there was a 47% prescribing rate among all the clinicians in the memory clinic. When they had Alzheimer's disease, the rate increased to 65%. And, and that makes sense since these medications are targeted towards an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. Um, but we also found that we are prescribing, um, this was interesting, the most, uh, or, or um, I guess our Asian patients are keeping the prescription on their medication list and taking cholinesterase inhibitors at the highest rates. So both in the dementia and the Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. Um, then in the middle is our white patients and then our black patients uh, come in taking lower amounts or being prescribed lower amounts of cholinesterase inhibitors. So I think at Duke, it would be interesting to ask, why is this occurring? Do we need to do more education in our patient populations or just uh, could be interesting to dig deeper into the root cause? So next steps uh, through EPIC search might be to continue tracking or prescribing of cholinesterase inhibitors over time and see if this uh, education makes any difference in our prescribing practices or in a uh, patient's willingness to take medications, and also examine prevalence of neuropsychiatric symptoms in the clinical setting. Right now, we do do the PHQ-9, the GAD-7, the GDS, and the neuropsychiatric neuropsychiatric inventory um, on all patients and caregivers that come into the clinic. And we, ex we hope to make this searchable um, in, the, um, in EPIC by putting it in these, this information in flow sheets. Some of them are already available in flow sheets like the PHQ-9 and the G87. And then uh, we hope also to expand the ability of primary care to track these metrics when they're doing cognitive evaluations. So we also want to examine our prescribing of anti-anxiety, antidepressants, and antipsychotics, and continue to expand the memory clinic biorepository so samples from our patients are available for examining biomarkers or genetic effects. So then I think we can also work within the health system and, and ask the question of how can the memory division work collaboratively with other specialties to provide an accurate diagnosis of neuropsychiatric symptoms and supportive care models to ensure psychotropic medication is used appropriately. And we're currently doing that with, um, with our colleagues in geriatrics. So um, we do a lot to monitor our treatment of neuropsychiatric symptoms ourselves. And I think overall, uh, we have to keep in mind our clinical goal for our patients, which is to have all of our patients have their best day every day, the way things are today. So that's sort of my motto when I see patients with these type of symptoms and um, also explain symptoms to caregivers. So and just establishing reasonable expectations is very important. So just want to acknowledge all the people that worked with me on this project uh, from 2020 to 2022 that was funded by Neurology and the Department of Population Sciences. And then uh, my last slide, which I'll leave on during any questions is highlighting our memory division research. So we have a broad range of faculty, residents, medical students, undergraduate students who are all interested in research in the memory disorders clinic. And we really think this is an exciting time um, with uh, more biomarker studies and information becoming available. So if anybody's interested, please talk to us. We would welcome you. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Kim and Michelle. Uh, anyone with questions, just raise your hand. But I, I entered a question for you. 
And Rich asks, how is it that all academics say nothing works for anything, yet all their patients are taking SSRIs and antipsychotics? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and I, I think in the clinic, we do have a high rate of patients who are taking these medications. I prescribe them. Um, we all prescribe them. And I, I think it's because we have nothing else to offer. And so there is placebo effect. Um, and uh, we, we just want to do something to help patients and caregivers, and they come to us very desperate. And, um, you know, we, we prescribe medications. But personally, I think this is subjective over my period of five years of treating patients, that just sitting down, having a talk with patients and caregivers about the disease, the changes to the brain, what to expect, how somebody's brain is changing, how their outlook changes, and how we can't expect their outlook to be the same as ours goes a long way. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced these medications work. I think there's a lot of placebo effect. And just as an FYI, that the placebo rate in these studies is 50%. I mean, if you had a drug that gave you a 50% benefit, that'd be a blockbuster. And so they don't allow us to give placebos. Uh, you know, that's kind of the craziness of it. All right, is there any on the internet? Let's see. We'll do Joe first, and I'll tee up the internet questions for you. Yeah, I appreciate your comment about getting primary care doctors. I, I would say that the other, the other problem for us in clinic is that if we actually prescribe that a lot of the primary care doctors or refuse to refill any medicine we prescribe because they say the neurologist prescribed that and then we're trapped following patients indefinitely to prescribe, you know, the nasal drill. Um, so, you know, any education, I mean, our only out is to do the recommendations in a consult and not schedule a follow-up. But unfortunately, some of the patient family expectation is, well, you're the expert, you're the neurologist, we should come back and see you you know, from our perspective, we don't have a lot more to offer than, you know, what the primary care doctor has. So, I mean, I think developing a system where the primary care doctor can be more comfortable with options with how the medicines work, et cetera, would be, would be really helpful. Yeah, I agree. And what Joel pointed out, if people can't hear online, is creating a system where primary care doctors are more comfortable prescribing these medications might be very helpful. So, um, yeah, and I think that does speak to education programs and just letting primary care physicians have more comfort with these medications and to know when to prescribe them and when not to, and maybe to know about their effectiveness and the fact that they're not always needed. But I think it, it is challenging in primary care because the duration of the appointment is so limited and it's really hard to educate patients. Um, maybe some mass education might work. Rich has always talked about that in dementia care and how, you know, um, you know, mass ed, we maybe as memory specialists, we should be offering more seminars to the public on expectations about these symptoms and what we what realistic expectations are for treatment, but we're definitely working with primary care. Primary care has come to us in the memory division and has an interest in doing more dementia evaluations and also um, sending us more e consults so that we can give them recommendations to implement. So I think that's a systems change that at least is occurring in the memory division. That's positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this might speak to the accuracy of studies like this, relying on Medicare coding data. All right. Oh, one more question.
Yeah, thanks, Ann. <laughs> Yeah, so Anne Augustine, our sleep specialist, wondering if sleep complaints are contributing to the high rate of benzodiazepine use. And we didn't look at that in, in this data. So I have no idea from this, but that what, what we try to do is correlate like a diagnosis of anxiety with the prescription of this um, anti-anxiety medication. So, but you're right, sleep, sleep issues could definitely affect the, the high rate. But I, I would say, as opposed to uh, SSRIs and antipsychotics, which we use like water, um, almost nobody in our clinic is on a benzo. So it's it's kind of surprising that in the community it's so, so widely used. That is definitely true. I think our memory clinic does a great job getting people off benzos and then making sure we don't prescribe them. All right. So thank you. Kate. Thank you. Great job. Great job, everybody. Be safe. You too, Michelle. Yeah.